Hi everyone, this is Counseling 2500, Chapter 12, Crisis and Natural Disaster Counseling. All right, so let's just kind of define uh, what we're talking about when we talk about natural disasters. That involves earthquakes, tsunamis. Tsunamis are basically like giant waves caused by earthquakes, um, volcanic eruptions, landslides, so landslides could be kind of like when it's raining a lot and then part of a hill or a mountain starts to, the soil starts to shift. Hurricanes, uh, storms in the ocean basically, floods, wildfires, heat waves, and droughts. And droughts are basically when there's no rain and everything is super dry. All right, so obviously when we have these natural disasters, there's an immediate impact on human lives. Um, you know, people normally can't prepare for something like that, really. Um, it just impacts them immediately. So we're talking about the destruction of the physical. We're, we're talking about homes, cars, and stuff like that. Also biological, so that could be us, humans, or plants and stuff like that, uh, animals. And then, of course, the social environment as well. Long-term impact on their health well-being and survival because let's say that the, the the water pipes burst or are contaminated now so there's no clean drinking water so that would impact our health right um, our mental well-being as well because we don't get the services that we need let's say the doctors are too busy with so many people and that then it could also impact you and your medication and stuff like that and then also survival in general right because if you're homeless you have no shelter, you could uh, be fighting for your lives that way. When a natural disaster hits, various services are needed. So we need to address shelter, sanitation, which is basically being clean, uh, whether it is, you know, clothing or physically and stuff like that, drinking water, food, clothing, and of course, uh, medical care. Um, so here are some examples of worldwide uh, events that are considered natural disasters. On March 11, 2011, there was a nine magnitude earthquake striking the east coast of Japan. So that caused a tsunami. Again, when an earthquake shakes a lot, the water also can be affected. And what that does is it can cause major waves, right? And so uh, 15,000 people died, 2,000 were missing. And then also, uh, there was also the Fukushima nuclear power plant, which was damaged, and that released radioactive materials. And in this slide right here, what you can see is basically actually the tsunami that basically go, went inside uh, into the town and kind of destroyed the entire town, right? You can see right there. Um, I hope that you guys remember it. I don't know if you do. That was about nine years ago, 10 years ago. And um, so um, I think I'm sure you guys remember it. And another one was January 2010. There was a seven magnitude earthquake that struck Haiti with multiple aftershocks, a lot of like 4.5, 5.1s uh, and stuff like that. About 100,000 people died and 3 million people were affected by it. And if you can see, you know, if the, the homes and, and the construction are not very uh, properly done, let's say, or very strong, obviously there's going to be a lot more damage, right? And also it's a, a, a country where a lot of people live in small areas. So then that could also impact, like, let's say one building gets, let's say, destroyed. A lot more people can be affected than a place where there's more of like just individual houses where maybe four or five people. Increase in natural disasters means that counselors will be part of this first responder uh, care team. So one of the things that if you are interested in working in this field is to think about and be knowledgeable about climate change, because that's like the, the number one um, discussion conversation piece when it comes to natural disasters is climate change, the environment. So as you can see right there, there's a connection there. And if you want to become a counselor that also specializes in climate change, that's, you know, a great niche for you to go into and establish your reputation that way. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the historical natural disasters in the United States. There's the Johnstown flood, which happened in May 31st, 1889 in Johnstown, uh, Pennsylvania. 
producer of high quality steel is what they were known for that town. The South Fork Dam failed after days of torrential rain, which basically means lots and lots of rain. So it kind of uh, broke down. So 20 million tons of water and debris hit the city and just kind of like pushed everything. And uh, 2,209 people died and 1,600 uh, homes were destroyed. And when I was reading a little bit about it, it said that when people were not let's say hurt or killed by the floods what happened right after that were all these major fires that happened and then that also additionally added more deaths to uh, the toll of this event then there is the dust bowl or the dirty 30s drought in the 1930s oklahoma texas kansas colorado and new mexico were affected the winds picked up the light soil into dense dust clouds, and they were also known as black blizzards, as you can see in this picture in this slide. Um, it would choke cattle, uh, drove people away to look for work at other places. So one of the things that you need to know, and I don't want to go to a science thing here, is that with soil, right, um, it tends to have grass and stuff like that, or trees, and that keeps the moisture in the soil, right? But once you remove the trees and the grass so that you can grow crops, what happens is then the moisture isn't really kept there. So what happens is then the soil gets dry and loose. So when the winds come, it picks it all up and then moves it around, which is what we're talking about here. And then there was Hurricane Betsy, which happened in Florida, Louisiana, and the Gulf Coast in September 1965, $1 billion in damage. Uh, the new levees for New Orleans were basically built uh, because of this, uh, this, this hurricane that damaged it. And uh, what we hear about is what happened in Hurricane Katrina. Remember the levees broke? And so when this Hurricane Betsy effect, uh, was affected in 1965, they actually rebuilt the levees to be stronger. However, uh, let's say 65, 75, 85, 95, 2005 ish. So 40 years later ish, um, unfortunately the levees were not as strong as they had hoped or lasted as long as they wanted it to be. And then it got ruined again. And we'll visit Hurricane Katrina in a couple of slides. All right, now let's talk about Hurricane Camille. That happened in August of 1969, a category five, which is the strongest hurricane to hit the United States in the 20th century. Uh, it affected the Gulf Coast, Virginia, and West Virginia. About 200 deaths and billions of dollars in damage, as you can see in this slide photograph. And then there were the heat waves in 1980 and 1988. So in 1980, there was about 90 degree plus for majority of the summer, um, agriculture damage due to the drought, $48 billion in damage, and about 10,000 people die from the heat stress related ailments. And I know that you guys think, oh, 90 degree plus, we're talking about in the hundreds, okay? And in areas that were not normally supposed to have this high of a thing for such a long time, right? So it's basically the entire summer and it was like over 100 years every day. And this is in the 1980s. And of course, you know, not everyone has that central air or air conditioning and stuff like that that we have now that we can take for granted. Um, and so that, you know, basically affected a lot of people. Think about all the older people who uh, basically kind of like, you know, were not able to cool down. In 1988, a long year drought caused another heat wave, $61 billion in damage. It was considered worse than the Dust Bowl, wildfires across Yellowstone National Park and Mount Rushmore, and about 10,000 people died then as well. So you can see the heat and the cold definitely are things that people want to pay attention to when it comes to the elderly, because um, uh, they might not have the capacity to uh, afford you know, air conditioning and stuff like that, the power grid, you know, and stuff. Then of course, now we're talking about Hurricane Katrina, 10,000 people sought shelter at the Superdome. Levy's breach led to a massive flooding of the city. 80% of New Orleans was underwater. Uh, government was too slow to meet the needs. Hundreds of thousands were displaced from Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. And if you remember when this happened, um, 
lots of people started to migrate to different areas. They came to LA, they came to all these places looking for work. Um, a lot of them were homeless and stuff like that. So I don't know if you remember that or not, but it's definitely really interesting to read if you don't remember it. 1,836 people died, $125 billion in damages, and parts of New Orleans are still not rebuilt to this day. And I will say that I was there uh, maybe five years ago or so, and there were areas when I was walking around where, you know, the damaged houses just still laid there, you know, and you can sort of see like the watermarks and everything uh, against the building. It's really fascinating. Um, very interesting. I suggest that you go to New Orleans if you can uh, and just visit. It's just a rich history of Americana there. Now let's talk a little bit about disaster and crisis response services, which kind of refers back to Hurricane Katrina when we were talking about the fact that people are slow to move to help them, right? So the Federal Emergency Management Agency, also known as FEMA, was created in 1979, uh, created due to natural and man-made disasters, consolidated disaster preparedness responsibilities performed by various federal agencies into one agency. So basically what that is, is that there's all these different teams, governmental teams that will help when there is a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. Uh, but the reason why they wanted to unite it all into one place is because everyone might have different ideas. So if it was all under one called FEMA, uh, hopefully all the rules and regulations and all the understanding of how to how attack this, uh, this issue will be more organized, right? But Hurricane Katrina showed that FEMA was not as organized as presumed. And I don't you remember if you remember, uh, or I don't know if you remember, when that happened, a lot of people were very critical about the help that they were not getting and how slow the help was. Especially for America, we are a first world nation, right? And to not be able to help our own people when there's a major disaster, it's just kind of crazy if you think about it. There's also the American Red Cross. They provide shelter, food, and health and mental health services, offer training to mental health professionals interested in helping in the future crisis. So again, if you're interested in working in this field, uh, you know, you might want to look into the Red Cross. Um, there's a local level as well where volunteer staff disaster action teams that respond to community house fires or floods. So when they're not working on, let's say, really big natural disasters and, uh, and stuff like that, they actually help people in the local community as well. Um, feeds emergency workers of other agencies, handles inquiries from concerned family members outside of disaster areas. You know, like when people are looking for their family members, they might go to the Red Cross to be able to then get connected to see if their family members are in the hospital or what. And of course, they also provide blood, which I think you're probably aware of when the Red Cross says that, you know, we're taking blood donations. Um, you're probably aware of that service that they offer. Then there is the Salvation Army, continual disaster training, and they also update equipment. They also coordinate and cooperate with federal, state, uh, county, and community emergency agencies and private agencies. They distribute clothing, toothbrushes, medical assistance, registration and identification of victims, sheltering, mass and mobile feeding, handling of donated goods. So you can see that they do work in somewhat similar things to the Red Cross, but they have their own eras as, as well. And a lot of these things, we're talking about hundreds of people that may need help. And so, you know, you need a big team to be able to stay organized and, uh, you know, understand what's going on. So now let's talk a little bit about counseling and disasters. Uh, specific training in traumatology and disaster response uses Maslow's hierarchy of needs as a guide. Um, so right here, I illustrate, or I put in the illustration of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a pyramid. And at the base is physiological needs. That is air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, and reproduction. And that's the basis, right? We need to have those things before we can actually co be concerned about other things. So th the next thing after that would be safety needs, such as personal security, employment, resources, health, and property. 
And then above that is not what we're going to talk about when it comes to uh, natural disasters, but just to address the fact that, you know, when a natural disaster happens is that you might lose uh, air quality, water uh, quality, food, shelter, sleep. And those are the things that uh, a counselor and their team, as well as, you know, let's say the Red Cross and, and all those other teams that we just talked about, they will help provide you know, and help uh, the community in that way. So meet basic needs first, such as safety, security, food, and shelter. And then you start to address the psychological needs, right? Because if you're so hungry, you can't really think, then you can't really talk about the things that are going on. Draw out strengths and capabilities, neighbors helping neighbor attitude. This is how it is. We're a community, we help each other. And that makes people feel good and safe, right? Um, so that's what, uh, when it comes to counseling is, you know, you are basically there to help the community. Prevent the development of post-traumatic stress disorder through safety, stabilization, self-care, and coping skills. So now we're going to start talking about the traumatic effects psychologically, right? So once uh, we're able to provide them with the physiological and safety needs, we can start talking about um, mental health care so that they don't have, let's say, long-term trauma, but instead are able to talk this out, connect with other people, get the supports that they need so that um, they feel like they're slowly rebuilding and coming back to what their lives were before this traumatic event. So when we talk about being a counselor during a traumatic event, we're also talking about informed consent, that those things still need to be applied and be considered, right? Um, informed consent may need to be shared with public agencies in order to secure housing, medical, or psychiatric services or referrals. So right there, we, we know that, let's say there is an organization that's going to help people who've been, uh, let's say, affected by Hurricane Katrina. That means that we cannot keep that private. We're going to say that our client is, has, you know, experienced Hurricane Katrina, and this is the reason why they deserve the services that, you know, are being offered. Disaster teams work with a group and may share information. Um, they're... Uh, when we talk about teams, you know, there's a group of people who are there. So instead of like, let's say in a typical agency uh, where you might report to a supervisor, you're actually going to now talk to each other as a team and make decisions that way. Again, so that means that some information will be uh, talked about amongst each other when it comes to in the professional setting. Um, so again, privacy or confidentiality might be different. Okay. Confidentiality will be different and the clients need to know that. May not have a supervisor on site, so must be able to consult with coworkers instead. Now let's talk a little bit about the effects of the natural disaster on the individual or the system. So what we're talking about now is how does it affect a person and the community around them? No one who experiences a natural disaster is untouched by it in some way the counselors included, because often the counselors actually probably live in that area or from that area, right? Um, the book talks a lot about Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory. So that's a really well-known, well-respected um, uh, model that talks about how people interact with their environment and stuff like that. So we're talking about being the individual, so the person, and then their microsystems, uh, which is then interacting with their mesosystem to their exosystem, their macrosystem, and then now they also have added the chronosystem. So you're like, oh, professor, what does this all mean? Um, I have linked here a YouTube link that really is good, and it only takes a couple of minutes to explain the entire thing. Um, this is not a sociology class. This is why I'm not going to explain it uh, right now in my lecture, but you should look at it so you understand it because there might be a question on one of the quizzes about this. Natural disasters may leave some people to mourn their spouses, their children, parents, close friends, and coworkers who might have been hurt or uh, may have been killed. Some may feel numb or unable to accept loss. They might feel shock, loss, anxiousness, and of course, being depressed. So here's some ethical considerations when it comes to, to this population of people that you might be working with. Consider their own competence and readiness to assist in a natural disaster. So again, we're always asking you as a counselor to know who you are, right? Can you deal with this type of stress uh, in a natural disaster or man-made disaster? Counselors may be traumatized or burnt out. If you, you know, see a lot of people injured, uh, 
crying all the time, let's say, all that stuff could uh, basically tear you down psychologically and stuff like that, and you can become exhausted. And we wanna make sure that you are grounded, right? And that you are able to handle all of this so that you can help everyone and still also be able to take care of yourself as well at the same time. Uh, it tends to be a minimal risk, however, uh, when it comes to your own. However, you want to also uh, be aware if you're going to be in this area helping people that uh, you're not lacking running water, but if it is, that could add, also add to it. Your safety, you might be in cramped living quarters, you know, sleeping in a tent or something even. I mean, if we're in America, most likely we're not going to, but you never know, right? Let's say another hurricane comes, um, you know, it could be very limited housing. You're not going to be at a really nice hotel or anything like that. And of course, maybe even having no electricity. Understand privilege. Some people need help, are undocumented, or do not understand governmental help. So here's something that they want to basically let you know is sometimes you're like, well, you know, this wasn't as bad as you think it is. However, the thing is, when it affects an entire community, a community is made up of a lot of different types of people, right? Some are uneducated, some are educated, some are undocumented. So they might go, hey, um, I feel like if I give you all my information, you might report me and then deport me right? So then they might not seek out help for it. So as a counselor, you might need to let people know that, you know, we welcome people who are undocumented. We're not going to report you in any way. We just want to make sure that you have the health uh, services that you need or the clean water and all that stuff uh, because we are in a major traumatic event, right? Or some people who don't think that they qualify for certain things and they actually do. Um, and that's because maybe they just don't understand all the legal jargon um, that is uh, put out or, you know, there's a lot of words sometimes in a contract. And you're like, I don't understand what any of this means. They're already distracted because of this uh, event. So as a counselor, you might have to help them with expl explaining all this stuff as well. Now let's talk about mass violence victimization, also known as MVV. So when we talk about natural disasters and MVV, the difference is really about where it comes from or the origination point. Um, this is deliberate sociopathic behaviors, mental illness, severe hatred or bias drive human behavior towards heinous actions. Heinous is basically another word for evil, okay, or very bad. So although we talk about this in a potentially mental health issue, it doesn't always have to be that way, right? Um, but it is part of the conversation. So when we talk about mass uh, violence victimization, it could be a, a riot, a hostage situation. Hostage is basically kind of like kidnapping, uh, or, you know, where you're like, I need, you need to give me $1 million and I'll let your child go or whatever. Arson, hijacking. Hijacking is basically, let's like, say, stealing a car while someone's in the car or a plane and stuff like that. Terrorism. Bioterrorism. Bioterrorism is basically using chemical warfare to destroy people. And then mass shootings, which I'm sure you're all familiar with when it comes to school shootings. Uh, and and, and the, the, the one that's also really famous is the one that was in the movie theater during the Batman. So in here, uh, we'll see these are all the terror attacks that happen in the United States with Americans themselves. So in this slide, you can see a grid of people. These are just some of the most famous ones that have happened recently. Um, and uh, just to let you know that when you hear the word terrorism, it doesn't always have to be a very specific location from, let's say, the Middle East, which is where we tend to, unfortunately, think that's where, uh, let's say, terrorism comes from. But it isn't. It's everywhere, unfortunately. And so uh, that's something that we will need to talk about as well. And you should be able to talk about these things as well. All right. People often feel helpless and out of control when it comes to a, a, a mass violent uh, victimization situation. Attempting to understand the senseless actions behind the violence, because sometimes people are basically going to ask these questions, right, when it happens, which is, what leads people to commit such a heinous crime? Or why does it seem so senseless? Like, you know, what, why, what, what were they thinking about? Um, what religion would ever promote this? You know, um, and how were there no signs that could this that this could happen, right? Because sometimes it just happens out of the blue. Like, where did this come from? You know, and so these are questions that are unanswered often because uh, the person who's doing it won't tell them, 
or they are killed or they kill themselves in the middle of the violent act. Uh, plotted by people who feel wronged in some way is one explanation. Uh, they might feel rage, anger, and entitlement that percolates until the opportunity presents itself for others to see and feel the pain of what the perpetrator has felt. So let's say the fact that, and I'm going to try to explain what that means basically, is that let's say they're really angry and because they've been rejected a lot, right? Uh, and so what they're going to do is they're going to let other people feel the sadness that they have been feeling this entire time by killing other people, right? It does not make sense and it, you know, it shouldn't make sense in that way, right? Uh, but it's really sad that this is how some people feel like this is logical to them when it really is, there's no logic to it. Uh, possible factors is that some of them may have been institutionalized before. Um, some of them may have gone through rehab facilities before. Some of them have been in jail or in prison incarceration before as well. Um, the more random the event, the more likely the severe mental illness. So that's an area that we do need to talk about, but we also don't want to associate mental illness with violence, okay? Sometimes people who have mental illness commit violent crimes, right? But it does not mean that all people with mental illness are violent, which is the problem that uh, people connect very easily because they don't understand mental illness. There's a lot of people with uh, mental health issues that are, uh, you know, good people, right? Most of them are, most of them, right? But um, those, the small fraction that get into the news, suddenly we apply and generalize that to everyone and that's not good. Um, higher rates of PTSD, depression, anxiety, and lasts for a longer time when it happens with uh, mass violence victimization. So when people survive through it, let's say, they might feel this much longer uh, than, than uh, other traumas. So now let's talk a little bit about survivor characteristics. So let's say that you survive a natural disaster or a uh, MVV, um, there are certain feelings that you're going to have, right? Um, often when you're alone as well, you're going to feel these things. You might withdraw from family and friends, experience survivor's guilt. So survivor's guilt is basically, let's say that there was a natural disaster and half your family died, right? So you start to feel guilty that you are alive, but your other family members did not make it. So why is it that you are the one who is still alive, but the other person isn't? And that can be very frustrating mentally for some people. Um, sometimes you'll see that, you know, there's doctors or lawyers, people that you think are really important in society who die, and you, let's say, who are just a college student, did not. So how is it that a person who is like part of the community, who has helped the community and all this stuff, they die, but you, with no achievements or whatever, um, are still alive. And so that can make you feel very guilty about, you know, how crazy the world can be, right? How crazy life can be. Uh, grow to feel immense distrust. So again, because it just happened out of the blue, most likely, you're going to be like, oh, well, it could happen again today. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen. And then you start to not feel like there's anything that you can believe in that is standard and stable and, and, and um, uh, under, you know, you, you can understand it. Family members feel anger and rage towards government agencies and assistance resources, especially if they don't get what they need immediately. You know, when you're hungry, you're hungry. You're going to fight, you're going to scream about those things, right? Or clean water or whatever it is. Um, and in MVV, resentment, revenge, demand justice are major factors in it, right? Someone who gets killed, uh, the family members are going to want revenge or justice, you know, depending on how they see it. Um, and then some people just want closure as well. When it comes to children and adolescents, uh, you have to think about it from a child's point of view, right? A lot of stuff, they see it from their own perspective. Uh, they don't see it from other people. They, they're not necessarily able to be as empathetic as an adult is, right? So because of this, they're egocentric, which basically means that their ego is the center of their world, uh, which is themselves, right? So in an egocentric world of a child, may incorrectly assume that the crisis was a result of their behavior. Maybe they stayed up really late that night and they shouldn't have, and that's the reason why this major event happened. That's what they think, that they messed up somehow and it was their fault, and they can feel very guilty about it, when it really isn't, because again, they're young, they don't understand. So long-term issues could be witnessing a loved one 
being murdered, mutilated, which is basically, you know, being cut up or, or, or injured, or taken. Um, and uh, let's say that if uh, they scream for help for a lot, but no one actually goes and helps them. And that could also be very traumatic for them as well. Careful that children do not get re-traumatized by watching the news, because sometimes when you see it being repeated over and over and over again, um, they the, it, it, it can dig into their mind and stay in their mind for a very long time. And that also applies to adults as well, right? But with children, we want to be conscious and wary of this part too. There is a four-step process when it comes to counseling in a natural disaster or an MVB. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2004 uh, brought up a four initial and immediate intervention goal. So goal number one is, or intervention again, is number one is identify those in need of immediate medical attention for stress reactions. Two, provide supportive assistance and protection from further harm. Three, facilitate connecting survivors with families and friends. And four, provide uh, information about the status of the crime scene, perpetrators, and immediate law enforcement efforts. Okay, it seems pretty logical and, and, and makes sense, right, in this steps. And then uh, when we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about different things, different other steps. Once an individual achieves emotional stabilization, so once they're not panicking, they're not freaking out, they're not full of anxiety, um, they might have some anxiety, obviously. Uh, you want to, number one, uh, alleviate distress through supportive listening, providing comfort, and empathy. Two, facilitate effective problem solving or immediate concerns. Three, recognize and address pre-existing psychiatric and or other health conditions in the context of the demands of the current stressors. Um, and in that one, I'll just say really quickly is let's say that they had a substance abuse issue. Now we want to pay attention to that because it could actually get worse, right? After a natural disaster or a mass uh, violent victimization uh, event. Provide psychoeducational information regarding post-traumatic re reactions and coping strategies. Um, and then of course, note for natural disasters, fixing, cleaning, and doing to avoid feelings of helplessness. Let's say, for example, your family goes through a tornado. So you might want to pick up stuff around the, the destroyed home and clean up or collect stuff. And that makes you feel a little bit better because um, you feel like you're doing something. If you're just sitting there, you start to think more and you might start to ruminate and, um, and focus on the negatives and not the uh, and, you know survival and stuff like that. And that could be mentally very exhausting for a person. So you see people starting to fix stuff or clean stuff, you know, let them let them do it because that's them trying to cope and process the information that's going on. And then long term counseling for some with pre existing psychiatric conditions or substance abuse, like we had mentioned before, assessments may help the counselor see this and also help prioritize group interventions or higher levels of care. So having them fill out specific types of assessments will maybe let you know that they have a substance issue or let's say uh, depression or you know whatever it is so that you can focus on that and address it and not ignore and let it get worse than it is. Group therapy can be incredibly effective because they feel connected, supported, universality, and the resources. So imagine if you all went through Hurricane Katrina and you meet together, when you guys talk about those feelings that you have, the other people relate to you, right? So you feel connected. You feel like the community is still there to support you and help you, and yet you're not alone. Uh, trauma is also very subjective. So considerations of the cultural impact on understanding, internalizing, and healing from trauma. So what that is saying is, depending on where you're from, how you are raised, uh, you might take in trauma differently. For some people, they might be very quiet because they're trying to process everything, while others are crying all the time, right? So there's different ways, and you have to understand that those are also things that might happen. You might not want to diagnose anyone uh, being a specific way when they're trying to process uh, a traumatic event in their heads within their own culture. 